the biggest things I focus on is helping people to get back to a place of hope. Hope. The morning show worth talking about. Faith at Work with Yvette Gavin. Hello and welcome. This is Faith at Work and I am your host, Yvette Gavin. Faith at Work is all about bringing you relevant content that will inspire and empower women of faith in the workplace. Our goal is to help you excel, not just do well in the marketplace, but excel in the marketplace and increase your kingdom influence while doing it. Has someone in the workplace offended you lately? As we all face these uncertain times of a pandemic in the midst of very high racial tension, if you will, we're beginning to see things and trusted coworkers, friends, and neighbors that quite frankly is disappointing and it can also be painful. I want to remind you today that as women of faith, we know that we're going to go through difficult times. As people of faith, we're going to go through different, difficult times. The Bible tells us in so many references, and the one that comes to mind right now is John 16, 33. We all grow when we go through difficult times in faith. Not during the easy time is where our faith grows. It's typically during the tough times. It is during the difficult times that what is already planted and rooted on the inside of us is exposed. Because during those difficult times, it's going to come out. Today, I want to give you some information, some tools that will help you actually excel in the difficult times. So the next time someone offend you, what comes out of you is going to be that thing, that essence, that spirit that will glorify our Father and allow you to maximize your influence for the kingdom of God in the workplace. See, one thing I do know for certain is that when we work our faith, and working our faith is all about putting to action everything that God tells us to do around whatever particular thing that we are praying for, asking for, believing for, but it's putting that action component with that. That's the work part of our faith. Doing what the word tell us to do and doing what we hear God speak into our hearts, doing that, putting action to it. I know what it's like to be offended by someone at work. I'm not immune to that. In the workplace, I've been called the B word. I've been called a heifer to my, to my face. I've been betrayed by coworkers whom I trust. I've been lied on by le other leaders. I know what it's like to hold offense, but I also know what it's like to be victorious over that by living out my faith in the marketplace. I want you, if you're thinking right now, oh my gosh, she got my attention because I'm going through some of that, I want you to stick around because my guest today is Chaplain Major Andy Shepard. Together, Chaplain Shepard and I are going to have a conversation that we believe will empower you to move beyond unforgiveness and offense and walk in the power that you're called to walk in. This is Leadership Handbag. In this segment, I am going to bring to you each week a tip or a tool that you can use to help develop your leadership skills. You know, ladies, we love our handbags. Whether it is a modest bag like this one or a little bit more high-end bag like this particular one. Whether the bag is small or big, all of our bags are going to have what? Necessary tools. Exactly. Today I have a necessary tool that I want to share with you in my handbag. And this necessary tool is a book by Dr. Robert Clinton, The Making of a Leader. 
Dr. Clinton outlines in this book what he refers to as the leadership emergence theory. He did a study on thousands of leaders, ministers and contemporary leaders, and he noticed a pattern. He identified five phases that he believed God takes each leader through. That very first of his five phases is referred to as a foundational phase. And that's where God is moving through our parents, our childhood environment and adolescent years and developing us as leaders. And that fifth one is the convergence phase where the leader is fully pretty, leadership skills are strongly developed to the point where the leader is yielding much fruit in the work that he or she is doing. I actually walk through this book as part of my course requirement at Oral Roberts University. And when I mapped out my own personal timeline, because Clint actually provides a timeline in the book that he suggests that readers use, my eyes was just op wide open. I began to see what Clint refers to as the three Ps, the patterns and the, the processes and the principles that God was using way back in my foundational days, right, through all the other phases to get me to where I am today to be here before you. It was amazing. And I want to share this material with you because I know it will bless you as it has been a blessing to me. When I began to map out my own timeline, I saw some things in my life, in my past, that I thought were barriers, that things that were holding me back or had held me back. And then I began to realize as I started analyzing those things under those three Ps that I just mentioned, they weren't barriers at all. They were really bridges. They were things that maybe wasn't as pleasant as I had hoped or would have wanted them to be, but they were the bridge that I needed to move forward in my career. I really want you to get this book, and I really want you to take some time as a leader to map out your own personal timeline. I believe there's going to be great discovery there for you. And you're going to see God's hand, his, his footprint, if you will, on all things in your life. And one of the things I walked away with after completing this work is that I made a very conscious decision. Once I understood where I am today in my timeline and what lies ahead of me in the future, seeing that bigger picture of the vision, that offense was not going to hold me back. I was not going to lose and miss my shot, my opportunity to actually walk out God purpose for my life. We've been talking about unforgiveness, offense, and I want to really just push this understanding of how when we walk in offense in the workplace and when we don't forgive, it holds us back. So I want you to get this book and it starts you off on your timeline. We have put a free copy of Dr. Clinton's timeline, little, you know, framework, if you will, on our website as a download so you can download it and start mapping your timeline out. But I will be honest with you, you're going to really want to read the book before you fully start walking that timeline out. But I did put it there for you so you can have a nice printed copy or you can actually use it online as well. The tip for today is to start looking at your life from a big picture. There is their seed in the foundational years and you know the early years and help you to understand where you are today and where you're going. This is a great tool for you. Again, it is The Making of a Leader by Dr. Robert Clinton. So that's the tool that I have for you today. If you use it and you find it to be a blessing or if you find that it wasn't a blessing, write me and let me know at Yvette at YvetteGavin.com. I want you to stay and be here when we come back from the break because I will be on set speaking with Chaplain Major Andy Shepard. See you after the break. 
COVID-19 has changed the way leaders engage teams, and it has caused teammates to shift how they communicate. Effective communication is more important today than ever to a team's growth and overall success. The John Maxwell Leadership Game, implemented by Yvette Gavin Consulting, can help you lead your team into more effective leadership and communication practices. Schedule your workshop today. Call us at 424-262. 2462 or email us at yvette at yvettegavin.com. Welcome back, everyone. I'm here on set with Major Andy Shepard. Andy is a chaplain in the U.S. Army. He's on active duty serving on the Fort Benny base in Georgia. I am so excited because Andy is a chaplain who serves as full time pastor or senior pastor, I should say, at the Sightseeing Road Chapel there on the Fort Benny base. He's well decorated, highly educated, and I know him personally as a man of strong faith. So I want to bring you the very best of the best, especially in this first show. And I can assure you that this is a man of faith who work it and walk it out every single day. So please join me and welcome Andy Shepard. So, such a pleasure hey, to have thank you here. You, thank you for saying yes to this invitation. Yeah, no problem. So, you know, with no further ado, I've just been hyping you up this morning. I want to get right into this conversation. Okay. So, you know, we're talking about what it looks like with faith at work. Okay. So let's start there. Why do you think so many people have a challenge with understanding what it really means when the word says faith without works is dead? Yeah, I, I think Yvette is that I think we're working, trying to work too hard. We're trying to force our uh, God to do something when it's not that it's, it's like going to a job and you telling in, without understanding what you're supposed to be doing. You just start working. Mm without understanding the job. So I think we do that with faith. Uh, I, I think when we want something or we believe in God is telling us something, I think we just start doing work that God hasn't even told us to do. And I'm saying is, it's very simple. Just do what your job description tell you to do. Yeah. Understand that and then do it. So same thing, I believe God give us the instruction on what to do and then that's what we do according to God's word, God word and then we're walking out of it. Yeah. So for instance, what if I'm like very faithful and serving as an usher or being the choir director at church and I'm there on time every single practice and every single service. Yeah. Isn't that work? Yeah, that, that, that is work, but if you're not doing what is expected from you uh, as the usher, as the deacon, or whoever, you know, uh, you, you're, you're doing unnecessary work mm -hmm. and probably not work that even maybe the senior pastor or the head usher is asking a needing from you to do. So it's, it's dead work. You're doing something that I didn't ask for you to do. Yeah. 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 So I, I feel at times when I, I talk with other Christians, especially, you know, as I'm coaching and counseling Christian women, there seem to be a challenge in their daily work as they're doing their work, whatever yeah. that pro, um, whatever their job may be, whether okay. they're in corporate America or they're a stay at home mom and yeah. she's taking care of the home and applying godly principles and allowing that to be infused in what they do. So what advice would you give a, a woman or a man in that case, a yeah. Christian, yeah. <laughs> basically, who, who find it to be somewhat challenging to do their work and also maintain their value system as a Christian? Yeah. So. The advice I would give is, is always stay focused to God's word. And, and what I mean about, about that is that, is that whatever we're doing, God has, has a, has a answer or have a way of doing it. Mm -hmm. And so if we stay focused to that versus how the world may tell us how to do it or how we may feel at times, uh, I think that will keep us focused to, to getting to our destiny of what God has called us to do, whether it's being a stay at home home mom, being or at work, dealing with folks, because everybody at work is, is not always walking in faith of, uh, and being a true Christian. So, yeah. so it's, we must stay focused to God's word. So any advice um, to our, our viewers yes. on how you stay focused on God's word? 
So, hey, it's not easy, yeah. what I'm about to say. Uh, it's not easy to stay focused sometimes. But what I try to do is start my day off right. Uh, so before I get out of bed, I, I try to, well, I don't try to do, I, I talk to God and I, then I listen more than I do talking uh, and, and listen to his word and focus on you know, what he's telling me to do. So I start my day off right. I get my mind right. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then once my mind is right and set, I'm ready for anything that you bring to me. Yeah. yeah. I, I like that about starting the day off right. Yeah. You know, in, in the word. Yeah. I refer to it as that devotional time each morning when I get up. Yep. I mean, I practice on the daily basis, early morning, you know, up rise yeah, and yeah, then yeah. putting that focus on praying and reading and yeah. studying the Bible and to get that day started off just right. So I've been noticing a lot of what I'm referring to as unforgiveness. Yeah. You know, I've had a lot of sisters reach out to me. And I, when I say sister, I'm talking sisters. I'm talking about women of faith. Okay. So not so much about, you know, a blood relative yeah. or a certain race, but just women of faith. Okay. And they are my sisters. Okay. And they're looking for advice on how to move forward in this current time. Okay. From the perspective of People are being hurt. Yeah. You know, the coronavirus have had us all locked into our homes mm -hmm. and we all had to start working remotely, or at least the majority of us. I, you know, forgive me for all of those frontline people who are saying, no, I'm still going every day. Yeah. We appreciate all that you're doing because truly they are our heroes. Yeah. But for many others, they're having to come into their homes and work and things have shifted. And one of those shifts is that as they're working remotely with other coworkers, mm -hmm. they're seeing behavior in coworkers that they had not seen when they were in the office with them. Okay. Which was heightened with the, uh, the racial tension that we have right now in the okay. U.S. And so I'm hearing people say, I thought she was my friend, uh, but I can't believe she said this. I can't believe she's this insensitive about what's going on. Or he was my friend, but now he's like having private phone conversations with our boss and saying some negative things about me. Yeah. People are hurting and people in the workplace are really becoming what I'm seeing at a a place where they're not the, the divide even with people who right. you used to sit next to perhaps in a cubicle or in an office so for that Christian yeah what advice would you give them on how to start managing and dealing with feelings negative feelings toward co-workers right now yeah so what I like to say you know, just looking even from the Bible, you know, God told us that in his word that love co covers a multitude of sin. Right. Because I like to say is that that is a lot of foolishness, a lot of talking, a lot of sin that's going on. So, you know, if we if we walk in that place and understand that we're loved by God first and you understand and receive that love, then you can walk in love with your neighbor as the Bible tell us. Uh, I like Matthew 5 when it talks about love your enemy, man. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I some That's enemies at work. <laughs> and, and it goes on and give us, it give us three things to tell us to do. It, it, it tells us, it says, he said, bless those that curse you. Mm. So, you know, those who are <laughs> talking about you and calling your names and he said, he said say something good about them. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's, that's that, a tough right. one. Say something good about your enemy. Yeah, yeah. Okay. The next one, next one might be even harder because it says, it says, do some good for those who hate you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. All right, yeah. Lord. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Send them something. You know, I, I, I often talk about it in my job, Yvette, how I had a Miss Mary, and Miss Mary uh, wasn't a nice person to me. And I remember when God told me one day, to, he said, if you want to straighten Miss Mary out, I was like, tell me, Lord, talk to me. <laughs> And he said, go do something good for Miss Mary. Matter of fact, he said, go give us some money. I said, I rebuke that devil. <laughs> I hear and that. So, so Yvette, I think, you know, the, the Bible is very clear. So the first thing he said, he says, you know, bless those who curse you. Yeah. He said, do, he said, for those that hate you, do something good for them. And he said, and, and this is the one that every Christian should be doing. He said, pray for those who, who despitefully right. use you yes. and persecute you. So, so those are the three things I would say that I, that I continue to try to work on is is not talking bad about someone talk bad about me that's how you bless them uh, and then doing something good for someone that I know that it that hate me and and the third thing then I pray for them. the perfect way to start your day family traffic meetings traffic family all can be stressors in our everyday lives but spending a few minutes with God can prepare you to take on the world 
The Faith at Work devotional is a perfect vehicle to do just that by helping you center on what's most important, your relationship with God. And now, for your donation of any amount, you'll receive a copy of the Faith at Work devotional. Just visit our website at www.faithatwork.tv. What do you think is maybe the number one reason why most people have a challenge with forgiveness? The number one reason that I believe is that uh, I believe a person most of the time we haven't forgiven ourselves or received forgiveness oh, yeah. from God. Yeah. So because it's hard to give someone something that we don't have. Mm. So if I don't if I don't have it uh, or don't feel that I have been forgiven of my own actions, it's hard to 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 give someone else something that you don't have or, or understand yeah. true forgiveness. That's a very good point. Yeah, I had not really considered that one before. Yeah. So thank you for that. I've also, you know, heard, dealt with people in counseling them and coaching them yeah. where they seem to just struggle with the fact if I forgive them, it's like I'm saying what they did to me was OK. Yeah. So what would you say back to a person who says I, I'm struggling mm. with forgiving because what they did was so wrong. Yeah. That I can't I don't want them to ever think that it was OK that they did that to me. Yes. I like that. Yeah. I like that one. OK. So well, I, I always like to go back to this. I said, oh, well, I asked a person, have you ever seen, have you ever had anything that you've done and you wanted someone to forgive you? And, and let's even go that you wanted God to forgive you. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And I said, I said, OK, if that's the case from that same place, from that same feeling of you wanting to be forgiven from someone or even from God. That's the way you do it for someone else. Yeah. Because that same God that forgave you, it's the same God to forgive the person that did whatever they done to you. Yeah. So it's, it's about receiving it. It's like, hey, if I receive God's forg uh, forgiveness, I have no right to hold someone in bondage. Yeah. Because I think that I'm letting them loose. Well, hey, I, I, well, honestly. You are. You are, and you want to because you also want to be released from your sin. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I said, so that's what helped me as when I see someone or I feel that someone have done something to me, it's the same place where I want to receive forgiveness. So that's the way I give it. So as I'm listening to you, um, it brought back to my remembrance a video that you have out now on Facebook where you're like carrying, I believe they call it the rucksack. Oh, my rucksack. Yes. Yeah. And with all that weight in it. And I was just thinking and visualizing as I was yeah. listening, is that a person who is walking around with unforgiveness yeah. is like carrying that rucksack, yeah. right? With whatever that offense, yeah. you know, was, and they're still carrying it. So will you just share with our viewers a little bit about your your whole concept around the teaching of the rucksack and carrying that unnecessary weight. Yes. So in the military, we carry a, a pack on our back and we call the rucksack, and it has the, the the required things we need for the mission that we're on. Okay. Uh, so so I look at a rucksack is is the required things that is in our lives, but you can bring extra things and put in your rucksack that you might not even need. Yeah. So there's more weight that you're carrying. And through miles and miles that we might be rucking anywhere from six to 12, 18 miles, it, more time, more weight you put in, it would, it would wear you down on your knees, your back. I mean, just everything, your neck, your ankle is everything, yeah. right? So, so I, I use the concept of saying is that, you know, God said in first Peter five and seven to cast all of our cares on him because he cares for us. Yes. He said, give that to me. And, and I used the rucksack as our soul. And I said, the more things we carry, unnecessary things in our soul, unnecessary people. Yeah. We carry people and thoughts that we don't need to be carrying. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So I used that and said, hey, get some things out of your rucksack mm. that shouldn't be there, like unforgiveness. Yes. Get that out of your rucksack. You don't need to carry that because that's a heavy weight that you carry in your soul. Right. But then I tell them there are some things in our rucksack we need to put in. And it is the love of God. And so if you have God love in your rucksack, man, it just lighten the load and you can carry that thing because, you know, you have the necessary essential thing in your soul that you need.
Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Yes. I often feel that people don't understand just how heavy unforgiveness is. You know, you know, I always tell people, you got to remember this thing over and over and over. Yeah. You know, and that's carrying it, because if I keep it in my mind, as you were saying, carrying thoughts that you don't necessarily need to keep carrying, you're having to remind yourself, oh, I forgot. I got I I don't like her. Yeah. (laughs) The girl down 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 the hallway, you know, did X, Y, Z or said this in a meeting to me. And so now when I see her, I got to remind myself I got to put that guard up yeah. versus just relaxing and being who you are yeah and getting your work done yeah so yeah so I love that whole concept of taking all that extra weight literally off yeah you know and and audience I tell you if you haven't seen his video and we'll put it up on Facebook you really owe it to yourself to go and watch the whole story around the rucksack is is highly um, I highly recommend it and is very impactful and understanding how to let some things go so this next question I want to ask you is also something I hear when I'm talking to people and coaching them through forgiveness is the trust factor and on, you know, when you choose to forgive. Yeah. So my question is this, I forgive a person, but should I immediately start trusting them again? That's a good question there, Yvette. <laughs> Thank you. So, so this is what I, this is just, this is what I tell people. So. You know, I think trust is, I tell people like this, I, when I first meet someone, you, you have my trust, yeah. right? I said, but you can lose the trust by how you, you know, you give me a reason. So, so trust and unforgiveness, I think that is something that, have, that has to be gained back. So I don't think just because when you forgive someone, you automatically trust someone again, yeah. right? If someone stole from me, I'm going to forgive you, but I tell you what, I'm going to be watching my stuff when you're around, yeah. right? I got to build that trust back that, you're, that you have shown me that I can trust you again. Yeah. So, so I think a lot of times we, we get those mixed up. We think forgiveness, unforgiveness, and trust goes together. It takes time to build that trust back. Yeah. I totally agree. This has been amazing. Yeah. And one of the things that we haven't even had a chance to touch on is what is really forgiveness? What yeah. does that really truly look like? Yeah. So Andy, I, I'm sorry, I have to ask you this on the spot because okay. our time is running out for today. Yeah. You, will you come back so we can finish this discussion? Absolutely. Thank you, Andy. I'm Yvette Gavin, reminding you that faith without works is dead. Executive presence has nothing to do with skill and talent. Executive presence is a measure of image.